a nuke agreement was negotiated. Goes back to the 1950s, Eisenhower recognized that some steps should be taken to minimize, limit the threat of uh, total destruction. He suggested an open skies treaty, which would give each side, that's the U.S. and Russia then, each side some information about the other so they wouldn't lead to accidental misunderstanding. Took a long time for that treaty to be established. Finally it was. 1960s and on, there were further steps towards limited arm, arms reduction. 1980s, after massive protests, huge protests in Europe and the United States, Reagan agreed to the proposals, Gorbachev's proposals for an INF treaty, intermediate range missiles, which was a great danger that reduced the threat, uh, went on with an, there was an ABM treaty very valuable in reducing threats, limited ABM installations to the capitals, um, Washington and Moscow, and one missile place, and various steps were taken. Starting around 2000, the United States started dismantling the whole arms control regime. It started with George W. Bush dismantling the ABM treaty Anti-ballistic missiles sound defensive, but every strategic analyst knows they're first strike weapons. There's no conceivable possibility that an ABM could stop a first strike, but it could imaginably, it's dubious, but imaginably stop a retaliatory strike much weaker. So therefore, it's essentially an inducement for a first strike. It's understood on all sides. Furthermore, these systems are of enormous threat to Russia. The United States places ABM systems almost on the Russian borders with pretexts which are so absurd, I hate to repeat them. Under Obama, the pretext was uh, we have to stop Iranian missiles, so we have to put ABM uh, installations on the border of Russia. Furthermore, these systems can be adapted to first strike weapons themselves by some technical manipulations. So to Russia, they're a serious threat. Well, Bush eliminated them. He also refused to join in uh, what was called the FISPAN Treaty, a treaty proposed by Russia to reduce the production of fissile materials. Refused. Get to the Trump administration. Trump just wanted to eliminate everything. Got rid of the Gorbachev, Reagan, INF Treaty, a very severe threat to Russia and the war, and to make it very clear that he meant it, immediately after the abrogation of the treaty, within weeks, the United States carried out missile tests violating the treaty, saying we're serious about it. Trump got rid of the Open Skies Treaty. He was about to get rid of the last treaty, the New START Treaty. Uh, Biden was able to rescue it by literally a couple of days. The, he accepted, as soon as Biden came in, he did accept the uh, Russian offer to extend the treaty. And regrettably, in his speech just yesterday, President Putin announced that the Russians are going to suspend their participation in the treaty. Now they're taking part in our effort to dismantle the arms control regime, which has, to some extent, reduced the severe threat of terminal destruction. Uh, there's a reason why the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists was moved recently to 90 seconds to midnight. During the Trump years, the analysts abandoned minutes, moved to seconds. Now it's 90 seconds to midnight. I think if they were to do it tomorrow, it would go closer. Uh, so it's uh, the nuke agreements, which did come about and had some impact, have almost all been gone and uh, puts us in even greater danger, along with the not only, first of all, the loose talk about nuclear war as if it's something imaginable, and also the steps that are being taken, both in Europe and in Asia,
to increase the likelihood of a nuclear war. Um, the United States recently has sent uh, has established permanent B-52 installations. B-52 are, of course, the major bombers for nuclear weapons. Permanent B-52 installations in Darwin, Australia. That's Northwest Australia, closest you can get to the to China. Just recently, it's doing the same thing in the U.S. military bases in Guam. Uh, all of these are it's running major uh, military maneuvers, naval maneuvers in the Pacific. Huge armadas, uh, RIMPAC. It's called uh, NATO itself has been expanded under U.S. pressure to include the whole Indo-Pacific region, meaning surrounding China, the U.S. trying, as Biden administration has established a policy in which China is to be, in their words, encircled by a, a ring of uh, what are called sentinel states armed with high-precision weapons provided by the United States aimed at China, uh, the the very provocative moves being taken with regard to Taiwan, a flashpoint, and then the economic war that Biden has announced that uh, is designed to try to prevent Chinese technological and economic development by uh, denying them the core elements of advanced technology, uh, semiconductors. Uh, the United States is trying to compel its U.S. Uh, uh, firms themselves are now uh, denied the right to provide such technology. Uh, the U.S. is imposing uh, the same conditions on other countries. It's not clear how they're going to respond. One of the major uh, industries that produces advanced elements for uh, semiconductors happens to be in the Netherlands. And uh, if they lose access to the China market, it'd be a very severe blow. Same with Samsung and South Korea. Same with Japan. Uh, the U.S. is the supply chain system for developing advanced technology is so intricate that parts are made everywhere. There's almost nothing that doesn't have some U.S. component in it, maybe a patent or something. And if uh, U.S. laws deny the right to use any of that, large part of the industrial system and allied countries will suffer severely. But that's all part of the effort to try to keep China from developing it's kind of striking. It's been pointed out by high-level analysts that U.S. policy by today is almost entirely negative. Not we can not something we can offer the world, but something we can prevent others from doing. And we offer, of course, the standard shibboleths, you know, democracy, freedom, and so on. But uh, very few people pay attention to that. In fact, uh, there was recently a important uh, international conference in Munich, the Munich Strategic Conference in uh, February, which uh, was quite interesting if you look at it in detail. It's been reported extensively in the foreign press. I didn't see much here, but there was a struggle between the United States and much of the rest of the world over uh, U.S. policy in Ukraine. U.S. policy in Ukraine is officially to continue the war in order to severely weaken Russia. Most of the world doesn't want that. The Latin America, Africa, Asia, almost unanimously opposed it. They said, no, we want to try to move towards some kind of steps which will call off the horrors before they get worse, instead of escalating them. U.S. was almost desperately trying to get some support 
for its policy of es escalating and continuing the war. One after another leader from Latin, even Latin America, our backyard, uh, Brazil, Colombia, other countries said, not for us. We want to move towards peaceful resolution. Uh, the uh, uh, You talk about rationality, I don't know what to say about it. The U.S. is increasingly isolated. I assume that uh, Biden's trip to Kiev a couple of days ago was, and then to Warsaw, was mainly a PR exercise to try to mobilize some kind of international support for the U.S. intention a program of maintaining, even escalating the war in order to severely weaken Russia. He went to places where this uh, will be, of course, welcomed. Uh, Ukraine, Poland, Poles, top priority for them is to kill Russians. They've been in involved in conflicts of Russia all through their history. So there's a warm reception. For Europe, this, is, this means heading towards significant decline. For the third world, not, they don't want anything, the global south doesn't want anything to do with it. Uh, India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, everywhere you look, they say, let's try to find a way out of this before it gets worse before we move up an escalation ladder. Uh, it's a striking phenomenon right now. India and Pakistan, uh, both are nuclear powers. Uh, both develop nuclear weapons outside the framework of the, uh, the uh, non-proliferation treaty agreement that called into action U.S. reactions to sanction them for this, actually under, uh, that was done for a long time. In the case of India, they've since been relieved. Uh, the Reagan administration pretended, I say pretended, that it did not know that uh, the Pakistani dictator, the Zia al-Haq dictatorship, was developing nuclear weapons didn't want to acknowledge that because the U.S. was relying on Pakistan as a base for carrying out its war in Afghanistan. And bear in mind that the goal of that war was not to liberate Afghanistan. It was to kill Russians. That was explicit on the part of the CIA chief in Islamabad who's running it. By now we have internal documents, Russian and American archives, which show clearly uh, that that was the purpose. The main scholarly study on this by Diego Cordovas, the UN negotiator who finally negotiated uh, Russian withdrawal over strong U.S. objections. He and Zelig Harrison, leading specialist on the topic, have a joint book discussing this the U.S. effort to maintain, to sustain the war, to harm Russia, to kill Russians, whatever the impact on Afghans might be. Uh, finally, the U.N. was able to negotiate a Russian withdrawal despite U.S. objections. And they put it straight. They say the U.S. policy was to fight Russia to the last Afghan. There's quite remarkable material on this. Spigniew Brzezinski, who was Carter's National Security Council advisor, uh, he uh, takes credit publicly for having uh, convinced Carter to send weapons to uh, anti-government forces in Afghanistan to try to draw the Russians in to protect the pro-Russian government called the Afghan trap, to draw them into the Afghan trap, and then to send more weapons, uh, mobilize more radical Islamists to keep them there, even when the Russians were trying to withdraw, which is now pretty much demonstrated by the archives, but was 
pretty well known before. Well, uh, Brzezinski was asked much later, uh, what did he think about this? He said, uh, what, what is more important, a number of uh, getting uh, weakening and undermining the Soviet Union or some agitated Muslims, okay? like about a million cadavers, among others. Well, that's the reasoning. We don't care much about agitated Muslims. We've got higher goals, like weakening our adversaries. I'm sorry, but that's, uh, that's the way the world works. The U.S. didn't invent it. Our predecessors in imperial sadism carried out similar policies. The use of AI gives the impression of progress, but it's very dangerous. Nothing works as predicted. Uh, for years, uh, uh, Tesla, other companies have been calling on, a lot of companies have been working on self-driving cars Something always goes wrong, something unpredictable. I mean, what these, we've seen the recent catastrophes with the release of some of these large language models like Bing, which all of a sudden go crazy doing all kinds of things you never anticipated, have to pull them off the market. They, uh, uh, what these systems basically do, we shouldn't be mystical about it, they scan astronomical amounts of data and find regularities that they can make use of to uh, make choices and decisions. In the case of the large language models, the choice is choose the next word after a sequence. Now, anyone who uses computers is familiar with autofill. You know, you're typing along on a message and the computer says, here's the next couple of words you ought to use. It's usually right, often uncanny. It's exactly what you had in mind. Usually, sometimes it's wildly wrong. And it's inherent in the nature of these systems that they cannot be truly accurate. You can't scan masses of data, find regularities, and expect, yeah, that's what you can do next. Oh, usually it works, sometimes not. To put these things in control, command and control, is essentially asking for suicide. We know case after case in the record in which human intervention stopped an automated response which could have set off a nuclear war. Uh, there are some famous cases. Vasily uh, Akhapov in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis Cuban Russian submarines were under attack by American destroyers, depth bombs. They had lost contact with Moscow. They had, uh, the commander assumed a nuclear a war is underway, figured we might as well go out in a blaze of glory, send off our nuclear tip torpedoes. Uh, protocol required that he had to get the assent of two officers. One of them refused. Vasily Akhapov. Okay, that's why we're around today. It was another famous case in 1983. Reagan was running a, a programs of simulating attacks on Russia, including nuclear attacks. And Reagan and his advisors assumed the Russians would understand that this is just for show. Well, it turned out they didn't understand that. They took it seriously. There was an automated warning of a, a missile attack. It reached a Russian officer. Petrov was his name. He just, the protocol was he was supposed to send it up to the higher command, and they would have a couple minutes to decide whether to launch a retaliatory attack. He just decided not to send it up. He said it wasn't credible. There weren't enough missiles. You couldn't have a missile attack with just that small number of missiles. Okay, saved us. Now, there was one time in uh, William Perry, Secretary of Defense under Carter, 
uh, information came about a Russian attack, automated information came to Carter, uh, to Perry. Uh, he uh, was supposed to transmit it to Carter. According to what he says, he was practically on the telephone when information came along saying it was a computer error. Uh, well, you just can't go along like that. There are case, hundreds of cases in which there were errors, uh, computer errors, uh, system errors, all of these complex systems of inefficiencies, unpredictable properties. Uh, anybody who uses a computer is familiar with that. And it's even worse when you have the complex systems of uh, modern putting. I think it's just inconceivable that any system like this would be allowed to enter into command and control. Uh, humans are capable of plenty of errors and plenty of mistakes, but at least there's a possibility that human intervention might recognize something that was unanticipated and not programmed in and can say, this can't be, let's stop it before we're finished. AI systems can't do that. People who are working on immediate issues like labor rights, racing, racism, Medicare, have to focus attention on what they're doing if they want to achieve anything. In principle, they ought to be at the same time trying to educate their constituencies on the large-scale threats that are in the background and may render all of this moot by just destroying us. But I don't think it's a tactical error to concentrate on local, more local issues that are critical and get attention of communities and groups focused on those to overcome them with an understanding in the background that there's a lot more for us to do. These are basic, basically tactical decisions, and I don't denigrate tactical decisions. They're of extraordinary importance. Those are the ones that have immediate human consequences, so you have to make them carefully and thoughtfully, considering the cir circumstances that you're facing. But I don't think a blanket criticism of such tactics is appropriate. We have to face the world as it exists. We can't carry out uh, activism uh, programs in a world that we prefer to imagine. So what is the world as it exists? As it exists, the general population does not have serious concerns about nuclear weapons or climate destruction. I haven't seen polls about nuclear weapons, but I'm sure we, they would show that that's not, not considered a, a prime, a high concern by most of the population. We have extensive polls on the environment. Pew Research and others, Yale University, carry out regular polls on this. The results are appalling. The latest Pew poll a week or so ago asked people to rank. Uh, they gave them a couple of dozen choices of issues to rank in terms of urgency. Nuclear weapons did not even make the list. It was not one of the things that they even thought worth asking about. Well, that's a reflection of their assessment of public opinion, which is probably accurate. What about what they call climate change, meaning destruction of the environment? Lowest on the rank of 2021 20, issues, I think it was. Climate change was lowest. Among Republicans, 13% thought it was an urgent issue. 13% much higher among Democrats, but nowhere near high enough. Well, those happen to be realities. Can't pretend they don't exist. And that means that there's an enormous educational, organizational uh, effort that has to be made. 
before we can hope that organizers will address these issues as things that they hope to mobilize people to respond to. You have to deal with the society and the institutions as they exist. It's unfortunate, but there's no choice. 13 is a lot in a swing state. Unfortunately, it's not. 13, even in a swing state, which is Republican, if it's a Republican state, 13% aren't going to do anything. It's, I mean, it's such a low number that it's too appalling to discuss. Here's the major issue that has ever arisen in human history, the question of whether humans can survive for an, in any decent form for another generation or two, the question whether your grandchildren are going to have a decent world to live in. 13%, we think we should consider it. I mean, uh, it's appalling, but it's a fact, and we have to deal with it. Can't overlook it. Final thoughts about Dan. Hopes for our film. Well, thoughts about Dan are easily expressed. As I said at the outset, he's done a number of things which are literally incomparable in their importance. Uh, Pentagon Papers was one, exposing the extraordinary dangers of nuclear war, the planning and so on is another. And in between, he's lived a truly exemplary life of acting on these concerns, always in the front lines. I mean, I've been in affinity groups and demonstrations where Dan was a participant and quickly became the leader, as he always does. Uh, but uh, he's just constantly working on this endlessly, tirelessly, enormous effect. Uh, again, incomparable contributions. Uh, what are the hopes? The hopes are that we must reach a point where when the Pew Research Center asks questions on what are the urgent issues they face and give a couple of dozen options, they not only include nuclear war, which now they don't do, but they get an answer which says it's the top climate destruction, nuclear war at the top. Everything else is lower. Go a long way to get there. If this film can contribute to that progress, it's an enormous contribution.